Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Carvigato. Welcome to today. Oh my, we are going into the next session of the Armor of God, and I pray that you are super blessed. It will be part 17, and I think we might be through with one more teaching, at the most, probably two more after today. So as you join on, be hopeful and expectant, and I'm saying that with emphasis and you'll see why in just a minute and so as you join in know that god is working romans 8 28 all things to your good because you love him and are called according to his purposes and again just in case you're coming on and you're saying hello i don't have the comments up right this minute but I will acknowledge it when I get off. I'm so super excited and blessed to have all of you a part of this broadcast. And it just so blesses and touches my heart when you reach out and say hello. I don't take it for granted. Let us enter into this broadcast in prayer. God, we just rejoice at your amazing, awesome name. And we thank you, God, that you are faithful and that you watch over your word to perform it and that you're going to strengthen us today, God, in your truth, in the knowledge of truth. As you add that truth unto us, making us abound in faith, hope, and love stirred with holiness, knowing that that you're going to work all things to our good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we are at Ephesians 6, verse 16. I've already done part of 17, and now we're going to verse 16 to do the shield of faith. The part that I did with 17 was the helmet of salvation. After the shield of faith, we'll do the word of truth, the sword of the spirit. And that will be the next broadcast. We're going to do one more teaching on the shield of faith. And it is just going to stir you up with hope. And I'm going to have some awesome acronyms as we look at the word of truth and know how to wage war against the enemy. We do not wage war against flesh and blood. We're not trying to refute arguments of people. We're refuting arguments in the invisible realm where the power of darkness is operative against truth in our members, where Jesus Christ is revealed in our person. The enemy hates Christ in you because Christ in you is the hope of glory. What does that mean? The hope of God's thoughts, God's opinions towards you, which are for a hope in the future. And so today, you're going to get practical application about how to quench the fiery darts of the enemy and what is exactly going on within your members of this internal warfare. Oh my, I felt this warfare, especially yesterday. <laughs> And today in my members, and it was this holy anger where I was just stirred with the righteousness of Christ Jesus, filled with righteousness, loving righteousness, hating lawlessness, and coming against the works of darkness. How many of you are glad that you're showing up today to get freedom? How many of you want freedom? And just before I get started, it cannot be emphasized enough. It's like I want to really get a bullhorn and shout from the rooftops. And it's funny because I've actually got my bedroom door closed, which is right here where I broadcast. Because right outside my bedroom door <clears throat> for the last two days, now three days, there have been workmen putting a roof on the building next to us. We are actually one of the highest buildings on this end, on this side of the historic district 
very high up and were built into a mountain. And so the building next to us, the roof is be right below our bedroom window. And so you can hear the workers outside. But I just think that that is so timing for those workmen to be working on the roof because we're going to see that analogous to the shield of faith is that sometimes those roof tiles, like for a while, and we've lived here five years, and for a while I've noticed as I looked out the window that there's been a tarp on that roof on the building next door, and I am thinking drafts, either rain or some type of weather elements are coming against that house, and how people inside of that apartment complex are getting the wherewithal the manifestation of what those elements do of weather and coming against their house. And I think about the shield of faith and how the fiery darts of the enemy are indicative of hitting those roof tiles and just removing it. See, all the enemy needs is just a little room, okay? He doesn't need big room. It's a toehold. And once he gets a toehold, the enemy is going to creep his way in. And you've got to refute the argument, 2, Tim, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 8. You've got to refute the argument immediately as it comes into your thoughts. But this is the thing, and this is where we're going to see faith in a new way as it relates to what's internally going on in your person. Because of past information, because of past information that's become a part of your reality, information stored at the receptor level, G-protein coupled receptor in your body, and in that receptor, it's encoded as memories, and it becomes driven memories, which are your emotions. And again, I forgot to emphasize, get mindfulness, the mind of Christ, on Amazon. So many people message me, and they say, Robin, I need freedom, I need, and I'm like, get the new book. The whole new book is about freedom. It's about consecration of the body. And it just brings so much truth to light. And also the self-image journal. I am really doing my best to get it out at the end of February. I am almost halfway through. And I'm trying to keep my coaching calls at a minimal. So I can write and get it out. Those of y'all who know me. Know that I used to do Mondays and Tuesdays, no coaching calls. Mondays and Tuesday were my coaching days, but it's not like this for this book. There's been sufficient grace for me to write throughout the week, and so pray that that self image journal is just so abounding for many to get healing and freedom by the Spirit of the Lord and by the truth that sets their members free. Amen. And so that will be out at the end of February. And people that don't have the mindfulness amount of Christ, they can still get just be the self-image journal. And they're going to abound in such grace, knowledge, and wisdom as their self-image is transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so it will benefit them. But it will benefit them all the more if they have mindfulness amount of Christ. And so as we get started with Ephesians 6, and we're going to look at Ephesians 6, verse 16. And we're going to return to the shield of faith. Amen. The shield of faith. And we're going to look at the potency of the shield of faith and how it operates against the works of darkness as you stand strong in truth. And I'm going to give you an acronym, and you're going to love this acronym. It is so amazing as we look at the fiery darts of the enemy that come against the shield of faith. Listen, the area in which the enemy really wants to attack God's people is in faith. Faith in what? Salvation. Remember we did salvation prior to doing the shield of faith? And salvation represents everything that there is that you have need of. It represents the truth, the righteousness, the peace of God. It represents who God is in your person. And so when you're being stirred in faith, you're being stirred in salvation. 
Salvation says Jesus is Lord. Salvation says that salvation saving grace is in God. Salvation says God's going to take care of me and all of my needs. Salvation says God has a destiny for me. Salvation says God is going to show me how to take care of my temple. And God is going to stir me up with holiness to protect my temple so that the present toxins and endocrine disruptors that are in this present age and the stress that the enemy would try to put on us will not prosper. Amen. And so we're going to look at those dynamics in today's broadcast as we look at the shield of faith. So let me turn to Ephesians 6. And I'm limited on my uh, laptop because it is slow right now. And so I'm having to do scripture straight from the book and not be able to unpack the Greek right now because it's just slow on the internet. It's just a slow process. And so let's look at Ephesians 6 and let's look at verse 16. Lift up over all the covering the shield of saving faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one. Lift up over all the covering, the shield of saving faith, upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one. That's what we're looking at today. Oh, it is going to do, it is going to let me go into the Greek. So we'll do that Greek in just a minute. And so the shield of faith, as we lift it up, It is quenching the fiery darts of the enemy. And we're going to look at darts today as an acronym and what darts represent. And so darts as an acronym represent the dong, D-U-N-G, poop. The dong aimed at the reality of truth and salvation, darts. The dung aimed against the dung aimed at truth, at the reality of truth of salvation. The dung aimed at the reality of truth of salvation. And so Nehemiah 2.13, Nehemiah 3.13, I've written about the dung gate and God's firewall healing of the soul. I believe it's probably about session eight of God's firewall healing of the soul. I haven't transposed that workbook into book form yet, but I've got three books from God's Fall Healing of the Soul series. And so at the dung gate, when I taught on it, God gave me a saying, and the saying was, Satan's gone and dung it again instead of done it again. Satan's gone and dung it again. I remember years ago, oh my goodness, it's probably about 2003. 2003, and if you could get this, it will totally change how you see others. It is so amazing. And so in 2003, God accelerated me on the highway of holiness. He lifted me into a grace of the fear of the Lord. And I delighted in the fear of the Lord. And it was made known in my members. And he added wisdom and knowledge to me about his perspective in this present age of seeing circumstances, life, and others. And so one of the areas that he really unpacked in an analogy that I'm about to share with you that forever changed about speaking about other people in a negative way, it was so revelational and revolutional. And so this is the analogy that God gave me. God said, Robin, when you're in righteousness, that garment that you're cleansing is the robe of righteousness. That's what you're given when you come into salvation is that robe of righteousness. And so the enemy comes against you and he just wants to throw dung. It's like getting poop and throwing poop on this white robe. It would be absolutely profane. It would be so profane. 
And God said, Robin, I want to show you something. That when you're talking bad about someone else, what you're doing is getting that poop and you're throwing it on that garment of righteousness on their person. But what it's really doing is coming upon me. And I'm projecting that own dung of the enemy against my person onto another person. And God said that is so profane. And many of my people, they speak in such profanity against the saints. And they find it just normal. They're familiar. It's just part of their familiar language. And it means nothing to them. And they do not realize that they will have to give an account for every idle word that they speak. Now, I just want to bring this up one more time, and then we'll get back to the teaching. But God wants me to interject it at this part of the broadcast. And so, probably about 2006, maybe 2007, I listened to this man's testimony. He died. He went to heaven. Then he was resurrected and brought back to life. And he brought a message upon his coming back to life. What happened when he died, he appeared before Christ at the judgment seat in this time. And he was put on trial for everything that he had spoken. And Christ had come against the words of evil that this man had spoken. And the man just denied it. And he said, no, I didn't say that. And then all of a sudden a witness was brought there and it witnessed about what the man had spoken. And do you know what that witness, do you know who that witness was? It was that man's own words. Do you hear that? It was the man's own words. And the witness brought into this courtroom was his own mouth. And it spoke what he had said. And so nothing was hidden. Everything was brought to light. And he came back to warn the church, know that you'll have to give an account. Be careful what you speak because you are going to have to give an account before the Lord. And so one of the areas that God showed me as we're looking at the flaming missiles of the enemy, it is what he would try to speak against truth in us, against the righteousness of Christ Jesus in us. That's what he is fighting. He is not fighting us because of who we are just as a person. He is fighting Christ in us because he knows the power of Christ. And this is where the Lord began to give me wisdom for today's broadcast. And I asked him, I said, God, I know you want an acronym for darts because I'm just really anointed for acronyms in order to help people bring things to memorization and just to bring it to light. And so he said, Robin, what darts are is they're indicative of the dung that is aimed at the reality of of truth in salvation that is the emphasis the enemy wants to throw dong and it's aimed at the reality of truth of your salvation just as when Jesus went into the wilderness Luke 4 Matthew 4 the enemy was throwing darts at the word and Jesus came back it is written it is written and the other thing that the enemy did as well was bring an assault against Jesus being the Son of God. He didn't know if he was the Son of God. He had an inkling he could be, but he was throwing darts. If you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God. And that's what the enemy would do against you and I. And we have to comprehend this. We aren't to defend truth. God himself defends truth. And when you have a righteous cause and that righteousness is in your members, it will make you bold in truth 
And that is what the enemy wants to shut up in you. Because that reality of truth can be sprayed out and be just excitement and hope and belief to others. It stirs holiness in their members. That's what Paul the Apostle was demonstrating in 1 Corinthians 2 from 2 to 4 where he said, I choose to know nothing except for Christ Jesus and Him crucified. What was he saying? I choose to know nothing except my salvation because it was that salvation that would keep him humble. It was that salvation the Apostle knew would be tested in him and it was that hope of his salvation that the shield of faith was it was that hope of salvation and so Paul went on to say I didn't when I came amongst you I came in fear and trembling I didn't preach with persuasive words but when I preached it was a demonstration of the power of Holy Spirit that stirred up holy emotions in the hearers of that word. And so what faith does is it stirs up information of truth within your members. And that's what the fiery darts of the enemy is aimed at. So let's look at a couple of Greek words and let's understand what's happening in the invisible realm of the spirit we're going to look at scripture the greek and we're also going to look at physics and i'm going to tell you what's literally going on as it relates to physics this word quench is shben numi shben numi and it means to extinguish it means to go out and it means to quench and so when we look at quench let's look at the English definition of quench and it means to satisfy by drinking to extinguish and it comes from the old English word swankon which means to put out in other words if you are filled up if you are satisfied with truth the enemy cannot put out the truth inside of you but the truth inside of you can put out the lie what I think about when I did property law and we looked at some of the property issues in relation to corporations as it related to tort damages and so we looked at property law and tort damages which tort damages are civil action as it relates to getting paid for any areas in which you have been wronged in land. And that's what I'm talking about with property law. And so one of the things we looked at was all the mining that takes place on the East Coast, especially in Pennsylvania. And one of the cases was about land where there had been a lot of mining underneath and somewhere at the top of the surface there were all these little holes that would open up and just fire would come out of these holes and you think about the saying putting out fires and you know you always relate it to maybe you have a little bonfire or a somewhat of a fire and you put out that fire no it's a totally different thing when it comes to this property law issue that's been in the past and in relation to these farmers that had all this land and mining had been done under it and all of a sudden on their property they had all these little holes all over the property and fires would be coming up all these little holes and so the enemy is bringing fire through the work that has been done underground and so those fires exhaust the farmer first and foremost the land is not good for farming second of all it is exhausted and i'll bring in my own issue where i share about ungodly jealousy that i wrote in detail and at his feet which is on amazon 
and chapter 7 about godly jealousy. And it exposes what godly jealousy is and what ungodly jealousy is. And so let me just give you an example. And this is going to really bring things to light. And so godly jealousy protects covenant. It's a shield around covenant. So a marriage, you're going to have a covenant, a shield around it. You're going to protect it around your children. There's a covenant to protect your children that God's put in your members. And it's operative in the emotion of jealousy. And so the purpose of being jealous, and God's name is jealous. He is a jealous God. He is an all-consuming fire. And so that protection of that emotion is to protect the marriage, is to protect your children, is to protect covenant. And so when I had gone through two marriages that were not good, and I was attacked against my members about being a great wife, about being a good wife, about being beautiful, about being just sufficient to be who I was called to be, in those relationships, there was so much trespass where other women were brought in and I was put in the place of godly jealousy and had a right to be godly jealous. And it just really offset and really diffused in a great measure my godly jealousy for good reason. And now shift I was single for four and a half years as a single mom. Then I get married to Rich in 2001. And Rich is very loyal as the day is forever. And he's got so much integrity. First and foremost, he loves God. Secondly, he's got great integrity that he would not be in any ungodly relationship because, first of, because he respects himself as well. And third of all, he loves me. And so those three things... I know that Rich would not cheat or have an affair on me. Well, because of all of that information, I want to emphasize the area of information. I'm going to keep coming back to information because when you realize that your subconscious is your information and then we come back to those little fires on that land in those farmer's properties where mining had been done underground, that represents a subconscious where new information is brought. And so it comes up and it starts fires. And those fires are the dung of the enemy's lies, the dung aimed at the reality of truth and salvation. And so because of re real and rightly godly jealousy in the prior two relationships, now I am on hyper alert. I need to be ready. My body is conditioned. It is a learned behavior in these past two relationships. And I really get into learned behavior in session 22 and session 23 of book coaching and show you learned behavior off the chain, bringing in Pavlo's law, but also bringing in about what our strongholds are as hypnosis. It is learned behavior. And so your body, your body is conditioned with this behavior because behavior is learned. And so your body is conditioned to expect a certain occurrence upon your members and then you're going to react or you're going to act to the level of what you expect. And so my body became conditioned that, hello, my man's about to cheat. I need to protect covenant. And also, in seeing the uh, addressing of women in those prior two relationships that were flirtatious, that were accepted, where I was able to see women doing flirtations with my husbands back in those prior two relationships, which stirred up godly jealousy, and rightly so. And so, thank God, Rich has wisdom and is very alert to how women can be inappropriate, appropriate, inappropriate and covet my husband, which I get into covetousness in Glory to Glory Sisterhood, book one, and about women coveting men, coveting other people and other relationships. And so as a result, I felt like I had to protect. I was on hyper alert to protect the covenant with my husband. 
And even though Rich wouldn't do anything wrong, my body had been conditioned. I'm about to be trespassed against in my covenant, in my marriage, and I need to protect it. And so I was putting out fires all day long when it was unnecessary because the enemy had thrown, thrown dung at my members about the reality of truth of my salvation. That because of God, because of Christ Jesus, the battle is the Lord's and that he defeats the enemy with truth. He totally cuts him up with truth. That sword is good for scripture, as it says in Psalm 74, 14, where God slices up Leviathan and feeds him to the creatures in the wilderness. And Leviathan represents the messages of Satan that are sent to distort truth and against truth. And so when we look at quenching the fiery darts of the enemy, we're looking at putting out these fires of what? Of information within our body. That's our subconscious. And I'm not going to unpack all of that right now. But you have to understand that what you believe is real is evolved from this information in your members and according to the degree that it's real to you at any given moment it's based on your mood now this is I know very big and over some people's heads and I don't want to get off on this particular teaching you have to understand that at the very core of who you are, you have an identity of your self-image. But that self-image at any given moment is filtered through the interpretation of your emotions, which are the memories that are unpacking in your body. That is written out in great detail in chapters 4 and 5 in Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ. And so a lot of people don't realize that they're acting throughout the day based on memories that are unpacking in their body, which is their emotions. And at any given moment, those emotions can be used by the enemy to start fires in their subconscious, in their land. Like that land that I was mentioning in the case in Pennsylvania that went to court. Because what the farmers needed was damages, reparations for what had been done to their land. And I think about Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways and pray to me and seek me, I will hear them and I will heal their land. That word land is iretz in Hebrew. And it's composed of olive, resh, and, and let me make sure which particular Hebrew letters I would say olive, resh, seid, or either tov, and possibly sheen. Let me get that. Hold on one second. I want to get that for you just so we can look at this because this is really going to come to light to you. And you have to understand that land is your body, okay? That's what man was made out of. Adam was made out of land, Adam was made out of the ground. And so when we see the core parable of the sower of seed, it's about the seed, the word being put where? In the land, in the ground. And so that represents the soul. So let's look at this particular Hebrew word that is used for land. Iretz, yes, Iretz. And it's composed of the Hebrew letters, Alif, Resh, and Seid. I was right, Seid. So Alif is the ancient symbol of an ox. It means strength, beginning first. Resh is the base of a man. It means head highest person. And said is a fish hook. It means catch, caught, desire, de need, and delight. <clears throat> and so the word picture for land is the strength of what has caught you is that which you delight in your person. Now think about this. The strength of what has caught you is that which you delight in your person. And so unknowingly, unconsciously, because of the information in your subconscious, that is contrary to salvation, which means that anything you have need of, 
God is going to provide it, no matter what it is. If you need deliverance, healing, if you need welfare for your soul, prosperity for your soul, if you need faith, if you need love, whatever you need, God is provider. You can trust Him. And so as it relates to our members, the strength that our members are given over to is what we're caught in. And understand it is for the moment. So many Christians just look at their life and the big picture and they're not disciples, which means disciplined, which means commitment. And that means that you're committed moment to moment, not just in the day. True disciples break down their smaller areas throughout the day, <clears throat> which means I'm not just committed in my time with God. I'm committed to relationships. I'm to God's way. I am committed to taking care of my temple. God's way. I am committed to my work, to my occupation, to whatever God's called me to do as my gift. God's way. So that every tiny part of your life, every little thing that God has his way. So this is what we're looking at with the shield of faith. Remember how God had me bring in the analogy of the farmland and there were fires all over the place? See, that's what the enemy does. As he brings in fires in your relationships, at work, friendships, at uh, your body. And you know, it just is like the enemy coming in like a flood, Isaiah 59, 10. But what does God say? He says, he shall raise up a standard and the enemy will what flee in seven directions. And so when we look at 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 16, actually, and we're looking at, in fact, let me read that because it is so beautiful. I love, love, love reading it to verse 16. It just absolutely blesses my heart. And it's so almost uh, like a poem to me. It's just the love of God should have brought in our hearts. So listen to this. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek, crave, require of necessity my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal, the, heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer offered in this place. For I have chosen and sanctified and set apart for holy use this house. And my name may be here forever. And my eyes and my heart will be here perpetually. So imagine now that all of those areas that had been dug underneath that ground where fires were coming up at the top of the ground. And some of them are still there today. Like these cases, I think were back in the 70s. But they still in some of these lands, and it's not just in Pennsylvania, it's in other areas too where there's mining done. There's still land that you can look out on the property and there's just little holes that have all this fire coming up. And so the land is not fit for use. And so when we look at God healing the land, it would be as though God filled in all of those places that the enemy dug out and he filled it in with himself, with fertile soil. That was good for use. That's what this is like. It is good for use. You have to get this in your network. That God allows the attacks of the enemy. He allows those fiery darts in order to build our faith. Faith again in Greek is pistis. And it means persuasion. And it means belief, and it comes from the root Greek primary word, which means friend. And so what's really being tested is your friendship with God. Will you stay a friend with Him when all hell breaks loose? When you have a gazillion fires going on, and you don't know what in the world is happening, and you're just weak. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 12. With Paul the Apostle, when he says, if I'm going to boast about anything in myself, it's about my infirmities. If I'm going to boast about anything good, it's in God. 
For God kept him from being puffed up as a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet his flesh, a thorn in the flesh, in order what? To keep him from being lifted in pride. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient. Three times Paul cried out. And so when those fiery darts of the enemy come at our person, it is to open our eyes for our need. Hebrews 4.16, that once we know our need, and we'll bring in the sort of the spirit later, which is in Hebrews 4.12, that the word is a double-edged sword. It cuts between our intents, our motive between flesh and spirit. And it's to cause us to know that which is in our members so that we run to the throne of grace boldly to obtain mercy for our time of need. So every attack of the enemy, it is allowed to let you know your need. Now, one of the things that God really taught me in such an incredible way, when I would get assault after assault after assault, initially going into full-time ministry, as Rich and I started our own ministry, as I left a job and went into full-time work, which was... February the 24th, 2011, so I'm going to hit 11 years coming this February, where I'm beginning the 11th year, or ending the 11th year, and uh, starting the 11th year, and just to learn about faith. So areas of your gift, the enemy will come and do fiery darts, and it's against that faith in you of that gift of that call that God will allow it to sharpen you where iron sharpens iron and that is why it's so important to surround yourself with godly counsel because you might faint without that godly wisdom as others who have already gone before and have been through things that they can give you gold nuggets of wisdom that you could take unto your person and be encouraged. And so one of the things that God taught me as it relates to my gift is that in order to promote me, that all these attacks, all these fires of the enemy came at me left and right to show me and prove that the devil could not control me. Now listen to this, because some of you watching this broadcast are at this very place. And a lot of, I've never heard anybody talk about this, but it's because it was me and God in this experience where I learned it in my person back in early ministry as different assaults came against my person as I had to lift up that shield of faith to walk in the gift of minister and not turn back and walk in the gifts of that ministry, which was the prophetic, which was healing of the soul. That's my anointing, and that's what I'm called to do. And even today, even in calling out false prophets, because I am a watchman, again, my maiden name is Robin Mead, M-E-A-D, Ward, and M-E-A-D means rear guard, reward, rear guard, as much as it means front guard, because reward actually means rear guard. Rear guard, so my name is Robin, rear guard and front guard. Shining fame, rear guard and front guard. So I cannot run from what I'm called to, which is watchman. And so a watchman walks in that prophetic anointing as well as a healing anointing. That's what a watchman walks in. Part of that, being a watchman, is calling out false prophecies and false prophets. And I've got one that I've posted back in 2018 about this minister that everybody seems to worship. And they just took every word he said and they just say how anointed it is when all of his word is totally contrary to truth, to scriptures. And I unpack it and pointed out how everything this man said is contrary to what scripture says, what Jesus himself says. And I still get attacks today about that 
exposure of false prophecy. And saints, you have to know, wherever God has called you, whatever job, whatever business, that there are going to be fiery darts of the enemy that are coming against that anointing. That gift that you're to enlarge in. Remember, this is a Jabez anointing year. God wants to enlarge your territory, but he has to know he can trust you. What does that mean? He has to know that the enemy cannot control you. And so God allowed these attacks of the enemy against my person to mature me, to keep me humble, and leaning my entire person on Christ Jesus and as I tell other ministers, even today, even though I've been in full-time ministry since 2011, God told me from the onset, he said, Robin, if you ever think you know how to do ministry, I will take you out of ministry because that is pride. He said, you have to know in your knower that you don't know how to do ministry, but that only I, God, know how to do ministry, not you, and that I will tell you each and every moment in ministry what to do. Where do we see this in scripture? Jesus said, I do nothing, I say nothing except for what I hear, what I see the Father doing. That is salvation. It is every moment. Jesus did it every moment. That is the shield of faith. Moment by moment. Why? Because in every moment, the enemy was testing him or he would leave and come back for an opportune time at different moments because you have to understand who you believe you are can change at a moment. And you say, no, it can't, Robin. Oh, yes, it can. It is called a mood. M O. O D. People don't understand this. They don't realize, and I'm trying to find out where it is in my book and just show you. It is in, let me see what chapter it's in, and I'll explain it, unpack it in great measure with the G protein coupled receptor and what is going on inside of your body with memories. It is in chapter four, and it is in on this page that has DNA. RNA and proteins, amino acids. And so those amino acids right there make up all the different things that are going on in your body that are brought together as the DNA, the information of the DNA is brought in a message by RNA and RNA communicates that to the ribosome and the ribosome takes all of these things and it makes different proteins and different amino acids that are go to your body. And so God had me take that and unpack it through your own self-image and what you believe about yourself. Because people don't realize, they don't, they don't realize it. And I've worked in outpatient psychotherapy and in ministry, and it, they're just drawn to me. It's an anointing I had, and that's why I've written uh, God's Fall Healing of the Souls, and especially this book. And I explain when I was nine years old and I watched the movie Sybil and it was then that I was hooked and the anointing of the hunger and thirst of the righteousness of truth was given to me and drove me to know how God heals the soul because the things that were put, in, put out in psychology and social work and counseling and psychotherapy did not witness to me and I would buy book after book and it just made no sense and even Christian books were put out about multiple personality disorder, which is also called dissociative disorder. And I experienced dissociative disorder after my first marriage, where I had a very physically, emotionally, mentally abusive husband that, again, I have not seen a movie to date that has that level of abuse that I underwent. And as a result, my land had a lot of fires. And the enemy just ravaged my subconscious and just dug holes into my soul and brought a devouring fire to come against anything good in me, which was the truth. And he just 
told me that I was nothing. And there was so much that I allowed my body to be in the presence of, of that abuse, of being physically abused, being locked in a house, being kept a prisoner, being having guns put to my head, knives put to my throat, and just totally disassociating that that had ever happened at that age in that nine-month marriage where I disassociated, where God is so gracious that He just moves away within your soul an area that will stop you from functioning to where you have the will to live. And that's why God does that. Otherwise, people would be dying left and right because we would not have the will to live. And so God's merciful and He just shuts that part of your person off in order just to keep you moving forward. And when it's time, He comes in and He heals your land. He removes that fire that's within your subconscious, that's information in your body that has conditioned you to behave a certain way and accept the enemy's lies. And so when we're looking at quenching the fiery darts of the enemy, and now let me get back to Ephesians 6. When we're looking at quenching the fiery darts of the enemy, we're looking at the healing of our land within the subconscious where he would have room to attack, to torment, to throw lies against the truth. And, you, and let me get back to this point. And you say, Robin, no, I don't have different personalities. Yes, you do. It is called a mood. It is called get a phone call, have someone say a certain thing to you, have a certain circumstance, and your mood will change based on what is happening. And you say, no, Robin, I have peace. Well, then you are perfect. You are perfect then. And I guess... You know, we need, we just need to be excited that you're so perfected. And I'm saying that sarcastically because I know none of you think that. Paul had to rely on Christ, on God, on Holy Spirit. That is why he said, he in summarization, I choose not to be puffed up in myself. I choose no, to know nothing about me. The only thing I choose to know anything about is about Christ Jesus and him crucified about my salvation because the enemy is going to fight you on the core issue of everything in your life in relation to your salvation and you're saying no robin it's about my finances it is about this it's about this it's about my job it's about my relationship it is called the core issue are you saved yes you listen i get a gazillion people that have this distortion in mood. And if you've ever said this, it is because you went into a mood and this personal reality, personality showed up where you said, am I even saved? I don't think I'm saved. I get a gazillion messages where people say, Robin, I am not saved. I know that I've done this. I'm no, it is called, you're in a mood. And that mood is interpreting your self-image, who you are. And so this is why we need John 14, 27, the shalom, the arena, the undisturbed peace that Christ leaves us. That undisturbed peace is where God restores your land. He restores all that the canker worm and the locusts have eaten, and he brings you to a place, as in verse 26 of Joel 2, where you eat and you're satisfied, you're filled. That's filling the holes where your land, your subconscious has been marred. Oh my goodness, the enemy is going to regret the day he ever messed with you. God showed me, he said, Robin, do you see every area where the enemy just dug in your soul? And I said, yes, God. He said, when I set you free, I went that deep to bring my glory. All the enemy did was take my glory deeper into you because of your need. Do you hear this, saints of God? It is so powerful, amen. And so 
we're extinguishing with that shield of faith the fiery darts. Oh, we, we got to stop here. So we'll come back. I didn't realize it was already this late. So we'll come back Thursday and we'll get to these fiery darts, which darts means the dung aimed at the reality of truth of salvation in you. So we'll get back to this on Thursday. Get ready. I pray that this broadcast has helped you. Let me know right in the comments if this broadcast helped you. God bless you. I love you.